A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second session in our Making Headway series. Ladies and gentlemen, in our session on enhancing remote live teaching, we talked about the various methods that were available to educators for them to be able to improve their synchronous teaching, particularly during times of remote learning. We anchored a lot of our conversations around issues that we are facing in this COVID pandemic, issues that many of us found to be novel, issues that many of us were not certain how to deal with. And in today's session, we delve deeper into the issue. We try to unpack some of the challenges that educators are facing, where they're not able to teach remotely in a live setting, where some of the learning has to happen in an asynchronous manner. How best can we go about doing that? What are the tools available out there? Should we rely on the discipline of students? Or should we give the students more freedom and let them tackle some of these issues at their own time. We hope to be able to better understand and unpack some of these issues during this webinar session. But before I go on to introduce our moderator, let me just share a little bit about the series, a little bit of the ground rules, and a little bit about what we are doing. So this series, today is our second session. And as I shared during our first session, we are happy to issue certificates of participation for those of you who attend all three sessions. So those of y'all who are joining us today have attended yesterday, uh, sorry, last week's session, do note that at the end of next week's session, we will be sharing a sign-up sheet for those of you who may be keen to have a certificate of participation. But ladies and gentlemen, please note that we are only able to provide certificates of participation for those who have attended the whole series, all three sessions via Zoom. So if you're currently watching us on Facebook Live, please do log in in the Zoom account and my colleagues will be sharing the login details on Facebook soon. Secondly, there is a Facebook group that we have set up, teaching, learning, leading. And I encourage all of you to join the group at your convenience where we can continue some of the discussions. I will share more about the group at the end of this session. So ladies and gentlemen, not to take any more of your time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this series, Dr. Kamela Arashan, who will go on to introduce our speakers and today's session. Dr. Arashan, please. Thank you very much for the introductory remarks, Sir Vignesh Naidu of the Head Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. We are happy to welcome our new participants and to welcome back the participants who were here with us last week to this three-part webinar series this November on the theme, Enhancing Remote Learning. There are three parts in this series, beginning with last week's session on enhancing remote live teaching, followed by today's session on supplementing online teaching. And then next week, on November 25, Enriching Remote Assessments. In this practitioner-focused series, we explore a wide spectrum of ideas for remote teaching and learning with special attention on how an engaging teaching learning process is both possible during the pandemic as well as possible in an inclusive manner. Today, we are happy to bring you three panelists who will share with us different ways of supplementing online instruction that are applicable in different contexts. Mr. Ramon Cristobal teaches mathematics at the Ateneo de Manila Junior High School in the Philippines, where he serves as the grade seven level team leader of the mathematics subject area. He has also served as a teacher trainer for both in-service and pre-service teachers on various occasions in different places in the Philippines. Ms. Rachel Francis is the Training and Programs Director at My Readers Malaysia. She is a Teach for Malaysia alumna with eight years of experience in the field of education. 
Rachel has a postgraduate diploma in education from the University Utara, Malaysia, as well as a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in English Language from the University Tunku Abdul Rahman. Mr. Angelo Unai is the school head of Cayetano Topacio Elementary School in the Philippines. He served as an elementary school teacher for 10 years, teaching subjects such as English and mathematics. He has also served as a learning facilitator and a resource speaker, conducting trainings related to mathematics education, as well as the performance management system of public school teachers. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in educational leadership and management. After hearing about the background of our panelists, I am sure you are all excited to listen to them already. But before that, let us first do a simple poll. We have a question for you and it's on the screen. It's about our topic, supplementing online teaching. The question, what challenges do you encounter with tasks for students that supplement online teaching? Please choose one. First choice, tasks outside online classes make many students feel isolated. Second choice, very few students are self-disciplined to complete tasks outside their online classes. Third choice, many parents or guardians do the tasks for the students. And final choice, students expect their teachers to be accessible and available to answer their questions 24-7. Kindly reply to this poll question and we shall see how our profile no, as, a, as a group of participants today look like a bit later during the session. Just go on please. No? Uh, you can continue responding to the poll question but let us proceed. Rightly or wrongly, Many educators perceived that most of teaching and learning occurred in the classroom or laboratory or audiovisual room or other venues in school where teachers and students encountered each other face to face. Thus, the pandemic implied degrees of learning loss as a consequence of an absence of face-to-face -face interactions. This afternoon, our first panelist, Mr. Ramon Cristobal, will challenge such thinking by focusing on asynchronous learning engagements that make a difference. Without any further delay, let us warmly welcome Sir Ramon, from the Ateneo de Manila Junior High School in the Philippines. Sir Ramon, you have the virtual stage. Thank you, Dr. Orason, and uh, good afternoon to all our uh, participants in this uh, webinar. And uh, hopefully you're doing quite well wherever you are at the moment. So let's begin our presentation. Now, um, I agree with, with Mom, what Mom uh, Orason mentioned that um, uh, over the last two school years, basically, it's been tough on uh, schools, especially those that were heavily reliant on face-to-face -face interactions. But the idea of asynchronous learning is not really a new idea at all. There have been a lot of uh, studies about asynchronous learning, uh, especially flipped classrooms over the last uh, more than a decade even. And uh, it was only highlighted mostly in uh, the time of the pandemic, wherein schools must still be open and, uh, of course, education must continue. So uh, thank you to the Head Foundation for this invitation. I'd like to uh, thank all the organizers. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd like to thank also all the teachers who are in this uh, Zoom webinar. So our first uh, 
talk will be on championing asynchronous learning and uh, these types of learnings that uh, we expect to make an impact. Now, during the time of the pandemic, uh, we were forced, of course, to, this was uh, uh, early March of 2020. And uh, when, when COVID hit our country, the Philippines, uh, a, a lot of schools, if not all schools, were forced to abruptly shut down. And um, I guess this is true for most any other place in the world also at the time. Um, public schools in particular in our country had uh, a lot more difficulty than most. And in particular, they were not able to complete the delivery of their planned curriculum. Uh, in our school in the Ateneo, we were actually quite fortunate because, because uh, at the time when uh, uh, the pandemic hit, our school year was almost uh, all, was, was all but over. We were in the final stages. We were already implementing our uh, final examinations uh, when uh, local lockdowns were, were imposed. Uh, nonetheless, right around March, uh, preparations for the new school year was already underway. And uh, there was very little time to, uh, to virtually rethink how the educational landscape of the following school year should look like. And uh, particularly, we had to look back again on how uh, our time away from students can be further maximized. Now, for, for this reason, um, we, we also need to reimagine our idea of um, the concept of, of uh, asynchronous learning time. For instance, what uh, activities must we be uh, able to give our students? Are we using uh, the time away from teachers uh, judiciously? How do we split the time away from classes? among all uh, subject areas, because of course there are multiple, and how do we decide which subject areas will take more time, will be given more time, will be given less time. Um, we also had to uh, think about what exactly what and how, uh, how much of the tasks can we entrust our students to learn by themselves? How do we expect them to be able to do it without our prodding? How do we balance constant practice, especially in, in our field, in mathematics? Uh, our general mantra is that uh, we learn math by doing math. And so practice is really vital. And um, again, the, the question uh, that, that we, need to, we needed to ask ourselves in, how do we balance constant practice in math in particular with uh, the idea of allotting family time? Because it's, it's I think, far more important now uh, more than ever and still enough leg room for uh, caring for our students' mental health, which is also very important, of course. Now, finally, we should also um, uh, ask ourselves, how, why should these ALMs or asynchronous learning materials go beyond just simple reading and, and watching? Um, they are, of course, very functional, but uh, how else can we engage our students than just assigning them YouTube links to videos uh, lesson videos, whether they are teacher made or they are just uh, scoured from from the web, or perhaps even assigning book pages to read and answer. How do we go beyond that, and how do we make our ALMs uh, more engaging? Now, uh, throughout our experience in the, the grade seven level, uh, we found that uh, ALMs that promote the following uh, characteristics. Namely, increased interactivity, uh, varied experiences, shared learning, creative thinking, problem solving, and discovery and conjecturing, as well as uh, developing insight. We've, we found that such uh, materials that uh, promote these characteristics not only uh, are beneficial to, to the point of delivering the content, but our students, in fact, find it more, more, uh, more engaging, more interesting. And uh, we've seen how they have gone to develop uh, this sense of independence in engaging with the materials. Of course, during the start of school year, you might not really expect them to engage it the way we want to. But little by little, when they develop that sort of habit, uh, it becomes quite natural. Now... Here are some of the uh, uh, materials that we were able to develop as a team uh, in grade seven. And uh, I, I, I have my grade seven team from last year and this school year to thank for the development of, of these uh, materials. For example, if you, if you look at this uh, uh, image right here, this is one of the, the 
PowerPoint presentations the, that we made as a team. And this is just simple PowerPoint presentation. And uh, there's really nothing wrong with that, uh, going old school with the uh, PowerPoint. However, there's also a danger that uh, relying too much on the classical functions of, the pow of PowerPoint can make our uh, ALMs quite stale. And uh, there's also that danger that students will simply browse through the slides. But we, uh, what we did was uh, we maximized the uh, um, little known, if you will, uh, functions of, of PowerPoint, like the triggers, to force them into engaging more with the material. For instance, this material right here made by PowerPoint is actually sort of, there's an embedded quiz in it where these uh, rounded rectangles are actually buttons that they select and will give them immediate feedback on uh, content like this one. Also, we extended this further, still on PowerPoint, if you notice, when we taught them Venn diagrams. This is a slide from PowerPoint, remember. But we were able to find ways. We explored, scoured the, the web, and we learned that you know you can turn it into a, an interactive Venn diagram like this. This is simply by PowerPoint, nothing too fancy. It's just by triggers and uh, changing of colors. One is fading out, one is fading in. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but that really spells the difference in how a student would either simply look at a Venn diagram or click on regions and be able to shade a Venn diagram as we would uh, during face-to-face -face classes. Now, uh, we also have explored other uh, platforms like, uh, like Scratch from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, like, like this one. Uh, this is a speed game among many speed games that we developed from last year. Um, none of us in the team, and, and, and this is true until, until uh, this school year, none of us really has uh, that uh, deep background on programming, but uh, the Scratch platform really offers a user-friendly uh, platform that allows uh, teachers like us to create games very simply uh, like this one. Uh, it engages the student, asks for their name. Here, our character is Buddy Jello. He's named Jello. And the student can type his name there. And it's like you're speaking with a, uh, a learning buddy. Uh, and this example is about uh, evaluating expressions where you input your answer. And if you notice the top right corner there, the time is being tracked also, as well as the score of the student. Now, um, next, we have also started exploring the idea of a shared, shared uh, sorry, le learning environment like uh, this one. This is via Google Slides. It's a simple, uh, it's a simple collection of shapes, if you will, where the students can freely, upon the introduction of a topic, can freely explore that topic by themselves, without the traditional teacher being the the source of the knowledge and lecturing and uh, giving out the inputs. Here, we just provided them with the initial materials and we task them by groups to, again, explore the web, see what they can learn, explore the materials, the worksheets that we uh, gave to them. And here, basically, this is a, uh, uh, an, a virtual Freyer model where they describe a certain concept. And we did this to 14 different properties of numbers that we uh, covered. And again, this is by Google Slides. And the students made this themselves. Uh, speaking about something that is made by students, here we have another uh, PowerPoint presentation, but in the in the form of a game. My students were able to uh, craft this. This is, I think, uh, based on a game called Among Us. I think they're quite fond of, of this game. And here, it's a very simple game because we also cannot expect our students to be, uh, you know, experts at programming. Uh, they are in grade seven after all, but, uh, but the idea is that here in, in, in such uh, opportunities, they can unleash their creativity like, like so. You know, there's an explosion and stuff there where they can input their answers. This is all student made, by the way. Next, we also uh, take pride, actually, our team in our uh, subject area in uh, trying to train our students to be uh, really good problem solvers. And we do that by providing them regularly with non-routine problem solving tasks like this one. Our mascot here is uh, Count Bond Count from Sesame Street. 
And uh, this started even before the pandemic. We just translated it in a virtual environment where we, via Google Slides, post our questions. And then uh, after some time, we reveal the answer and a possible solution uh, on that website, as well as the winners. We turned this into some uh, form of a simple tournament for our students. And they like this. We have tremendous... Uh, uh, participation in this every week. Our students always uh, ask us, will there be problem of the night? And this is a misnomer, perhaps. It's not really implemented at night. We just call it that because our mascot is a vampire, of course. Next one. Here we have, uh, we also uh, uh, focus on having students discover the information and make conjectures rather than us providing them with the, the concepts. Here, uh, this is a simple slide uh, where you where a, a student can make ed uh, editings can input conjectures can input uh, values here in the orange table but what is most important in this slide right here is that there is an embedded link right under the instruction here follow the instructions on ga8d that is a working link that directs them to a teacher made applet our team also uh, constructed this applet and it's about, uh, in this case, uh, parallelograms, where they would discover three particular properties of parallelograms. And you will see here, there are multiple uh, buttons that they can toggle, checkboxes rather, that they can toggle, and they can uh, manipulate that parallelogram. And for themselves, that's the goal, for them to be able to see for themselves what the properties are, uh, regardless of how they tweak the, the shape. They should be able to uh, detect three properties here. Number one, that the opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. Number two, that the interior angles first, uh, the opposite ones are congruent and the consecutive ones are supplementary. And finally here, we're trying to make them discover that the diagonals bisect each other for a parallelogram. Now again, this is a, a take, take off from, from uh, the classical setup where the teacher dictates these or, or post slips or writes them on the board and has the student take them down on their notebook and memorize them. This is a really good activity and we've seen how much deeper the student's understanding gets after they engage such activities. And finally, we uh, also uh, uh, emphasize the use of materials that develop insight. Here, we, uh, again, this is uh, a lesson on sets applying the Venn diagrams. Here, we use the context of vaccines. Uh, three among the many vaccines uh, that are available in the Philippines are highlighted in this presentation here. This is still via Google Slides. And if you notice, there are links there that they can click onto. Uh, the first one here directs them to the Department of Health, the Philippine Department of Health, where they can find information on vaccines. And the other link is, on, uh, is for CDC, Centers for Disease Control. So they get to develop a deeper understanding of these vaccines and not just what they hear from, you know, from social media, which, which is still okay. But here, basically, this is fact-based. This is, um, these are information from, uh, from the DOH and, and the CDC, and uh, they are really accurate data, and they're able to engage with those data by themselves. Now, uh, here are some of the, the key learnings that we, uh, we've had over the last two school years. Number one, uh, we, we'd, we'd like to imagine that ALMs, asynchronous learning materials, or asynchronous learning itself, should not be something that is closely associated only with uh, online learning. Rather, it sh should be a, an educational staple. Uh, uh, that is something that should be explored by schools everywhere in that uh, its effectiveness has time and again been proven in, in studies in international studies, even before the pandemic. Uh, also, we, we also learned that they're providing these opportunities for students to discover the learning by, by themselves rather than us providing it for them uh, makes their understanding uh, of concepts much, much deeper than what it classically was. Uh, student engagement is much higher. Uh, student performance is uh, significantly higher as well. And they're far more interested we have also spoken with parents and how parents themselves, when they see the materials being engaged by their students, but by their sons, um, they actually learn from our materials as well, which is a good uh, thing to hear from our stakeholders. And the idea also that uh, asynchronous learning materials 
uh, the, uh, that, that, that idea is for lazy teachers. No, it actually is the opposite. The development of these materials is actually quite tasking. It's challenging. It's not impossible, of course, but it is very challenging. But once these materials are, are ready, are, are, uh, are developed, you, know, you can reuse them year after year with just minor revisions to them. Now, finally, here are some recommendations that our grade 17 from the Ateneo de Manila Junior High School can make to, to uh, hopefully give to uh, other teachers in the field. Number one, uh, to, to pioneer uh, initiatives like, like, like these no? in your individual schools, even and if and when we do come back to school, hopefully it's, it's sooner rather than later. One of the reasons why our grade 17 was able to maximize these uh, uh, endeavors was that even before the pandemic, we were already pioneering them. Uh, we were already exploring the idea of flipped classrooms. So when the 2021, 2020-2021 um, uh, school year came in, the transition was relatively smooth and seamless. Number two, uh, try it out first in your classes and uh, share what your experiences are to your teacher friends. Turning this into a departmental effort may seem like something too much to ask immediately. Uh, so, you know, individual classes first, document all the stages of the implementation, and share with your teammates uh, what the learnings and challenges are of implementing such practices. And finally, uh, consistently solicit feedback from parents, from, from students especially. In the use of these various modalities and, uh, and, and platforms, it's very easy, of course, to uh, get lost in all the excitement of learning new things uh, and using all these new things in the classroom. But it's, it's always good to remind ourselves to remember that these technologies and these initiatives are only a means to an end uh, and that our curricular goals uh, for our students, their uh, well-being, their mental, physical, and, and intellectual well-being should still be at the center of all our collective action. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something from this very short presentation. I think Sir Ramon is somehow asserting through his presentation that remote teaching does not have to imply learning loss. Thank you very much, Sir Ramon, for a stimulating presentation. Now that we are in the second academic year after the virus caught all of us by surprise, your point about taking advantage of asynchronous learning as an educational staple rather than a novel enterprise should not be taken for granted. Time outside online classes is not just for drills, like the way we perceived homework perhaps when classes were still face-to-face. Well-prepared asynchronous learning materials can be a great opportunity for teaching and learning lessons and for enabling student-generated knowledge. Once again, thank you very much, Sir Ramon. For many educators, the view that learning has been compromised by the shift from face-to-face -face classes to remote teaching and learning processes may be especially true in the case of younger children. I'm sure we all understand the challenges of teaching the basics of reading, of writing, and mathematics to the very young children. Thus, one important area of concern, especially during the pandemic, is literacy development more so in under-resourced environments. At this point, our second panelist, Ms. Rachel Francis, will present to us the initiative of My Readers Malaysia in this area. Rachel, the screen is yours. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel. Uh, I'm currently the Director of Training and Programs at My Readers. Today, I'll be sharing a little bit about bridging the literacy gap, gap through WhatsApp. Um, and so, here it is. So, My Readers was set up in 2015 to solve a problem in Malaysia um, with the vision that one day every child will be able to read. 
So if this is a snapshot of our PISA assessment results and PISA is an international assessment and Malaysia ranks really low on that in terms of reading. And this is conducted in the national language, which is Bahasa Melayu. So um, my readers, um, when we set it up, our mission was to empower children through communities by providing structured and sustainable one-to-one -one remedial reading programs. So we do this with the support of peer mentors in school and volunteer tutors in the community. So um, in March last year, you know, when nationwide lockdowns were implemented in Malaysia, uh, we had to stop all our face-to-face -face reading programs, which included students uh, being guided through our physical literacy toolkit by in-person volunteer tutors. So if you see this, that image uh, on the screen, that's our volunteer tutors actually conducting the reading sessions in person. So two questions that we were faced with is what happens to them um, under COVID restrictions? And the second one being like, how do we reach learners from underserved communities? So the solution that we came up with is uh, reading sessions over WhatsApp. And it's thanks to a suggestion by one of our volunteer tutors, actually. Um, so what happened after that, we surveyed parents and conducted discussions with our volunteer tutors before deciding to pivot to a WhatsApp-based delivery model. So here you see a child learning uh, from home via WhatsApp. And this is like what a back end looks like for a volunteer. Um, so two sites. Uh, and, and in two different homes. So this platform was chosen based on our polls with the families, um, which found that they had at least uh, one mobile phone with prepaid internet data available, and they were already familiar with the usage of um, WhatsApp. Our volunteer tutors also, um, their input based on their knowledge of their students also helped us uh, in designing um, the solution. So here you see, um, the, the kind of the lesson plan that we show or we prepare volunteer tutors with. So one thing uh, to note is our volunteer tutors are not experienced teachers. They're just members of the community who are concerned uh, about solving this problem. So what happened was, uh, is we digitized all of our physical modules into bite-sized videos and images. Um, and the thing is, our volunteer tutors actually helped us do this because um, later, I will show you, we, we had to do this in such a short time. So we shared our solution with educators around the world as well through like Teach for All's uh, Teaching Without Internet Alliance. Uh, we continued to improve on these resources uh, by creating a very intuitive lesson guide for our volunteer tutors to access. So this helped them because they're not teachers uh, by default. So having a lesson guide that was easy to follow was really helpful. So here's an example of how a class happens um, on the left side of my screen over here. Um, so the, vo the, the volunteer tutor sends over uh, a text and um, they either read it if the student cannot read it or, um, and the student reads it back. And so there's like live feedback happening as the classes go on. So for students who cannot read, uh, who are at that stage where they cannot decode um, uh, letters yet, what happens is the volunteer tutor press, uh, records reading and um, sorry, records instructions and sends it over for the child to respond. So what happened at the end of the year, uh, we completed 42 hours of reading. Uh, 38 children and from 38 homes were supported throughout this period. We had a total of 150 volunteers joining us on this journey of online teaching. Uh, we completed a total of 28 weeks of reading. There was no disruption. Um, or long disruption to the reading program. So here I'm gonna share with you the implementation plan. Uh, between January to March, we actually were conducting the sessions in person. We had a total of 111 um, volunteers actually. So uh, 111 volunteers, uh, mainly because the volunteer pairing was not consistent at that point. Um, Sometimes volunteers uh, uh, committed for two to three weeks and then they couldn't make it. So we had uh, different volunteers reading with different students all the time. Um, on the 18th of March, schools in Malaysia uh, were closed or actually nationwide lockdowns were implemented. Um, on the 20th of March, that's when the brainstorming session with the volunteer tutors took place. And 
just a week later, we piloted our first WhatsApp reading session. It was not perfect at that point. There were so many things that we hadn't figured out yet, but we just decided to start. Um, and one thing that we saw was that the 13 volunteers that started with us, 11 of them stayed till the end of the program. So uh, at the end of the session or the, at the end of the semester, which is 17th October, we conducted our final WhatsApp reading session for the year. There were 37 volunteer tutors with us. And now you see that the number of tutors and the number of students is the same because we, through pivoting to WhatsApp, uh, we managed to have a consistent pairing between the volunteers and the students um, and also be able to com uh, communicate that, that upfront to volunteer tutors. So they were only signing up if they could commit for the du entire duration of the program. So a little bit, uh, I think I just wanted to show you how this, the journey of the child is from start to end. So first we conduct reading assessments uh, over WhatsApp as well. We send them a passage, we ask them to record their reading over voice note and send it to us. Um, and if they're selected for the program, what, ha what happens is we deliver the physical toolkit to them just to make it easier for them to refer to it or read during the week as well. The classes are conducted um, over WhatsApp. So you can see in this image, there's a phone that this student is looking at and there's the book in front of him. Uh, over here, there's an image of the parent reading uh, with the child. But um, so the way we implemented the online classes, one of the challenges that we faced was actually sometimes the students couldn't focus long enough um, to sit next to the phone because it's a virtual class, right? Uh, and I think a lot of you might face that challenge too. We asked the parents to sit next to the child to supervise that uh, learning session just so that um, just so that we know that they are engaged throughout the whole uh, lesson. And what happens is parents also started learning throughout that um, journey. So here's a little bit of a volunteer journey. They undergo virtual training. They get to observe a WhatsApp class. So they are added into a WhatsApp group where a volunteer tutor is teaching a child. And then we also give them an opportunity to undergo a mock session themselves. So this looks like uh, one of us at My Reader's role playing as a student and they get to practice before they do the real thing with their real student. Um, some of the things that we put in place is we put our, all of our volunteers into a WhatsApp group where they get to share best practices and debrief after classes weekly. So all reading sessions um, happen in individual WhatsApp groups, one-to-one, -one, volunteer, tutor, and child, um, along with a coordinator. But in this WhatsApp group where they have all volunteers together, they get to share best practices. We also have upskilling training for volunteers so that they're also developing in this whole journey. So some of the key learning points from our journey um, was to actually design solutions with the community. Uh, having the volunteers, having the parents be part of um, the solution or, or, or to be able to consult in trying to design the solution was really helpful. Um, leveraging on the existing resources surrounding the child, having the parents involved in the program has made it so much better, has made uh, the child's engagement so that much better. And this was an opportunity we couldn't tap into um, pre-pandemic actually, because the when the sessions were conducted in person, parents would drop off their children and just uh, go off somewhere else. Um, some of the things that we learned is also that having an imperfect solution was better than no solution at all. I think if we had tried to wait to figure everything out, we would have taken too long and the children would have been um, without a, a solution for a while. Some of the tips that I have to share with you educators, um, is don't wait to know all the answers to start. I think sometimes we are caught up with designing perfect programs and they take too long, but the need is great. Um, so we might need to just uh, start with something. Avoid getting too attached to the first version of a solution. I think uh, I've, in my experience uh, in schools and also to different organizations, sometimes we design a first version that we think is perfect and Along the way, we might be, uh, we might have to change it, but it can be, we can feel quite attached to that first version that we created, but 
um, I think trying to adapt to the beneficiary's needs, your client's needs is the most important. So the third point being always work with the needs of the child at the center. So as educators, we want to um, uh, share solutions or create uh, programs that uh, suit the children best, that meet the needs best. So I think um, that's the last tip that I have to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Rachel, for sharing with us an innovative solution to the literacy gap. I wonder how many attempted to use WhatsApp for such purpose before the pandemic. It's very encouraging to learn about how you conducted reading assessments and reading sessions over WhatsApp. Importantly, your concluding words serve as an assurance to us for all of us, that while you specifically illustrated the use of WhatsApp, instruction aimed at addressing the literacy gap does not have to be through WhatsApp. You emphasized that it is important, that what is important is to leverage on existing resources and to engage the community. Thus, the same end that you achieved through WhatsApp can also be achieved perhaps by using Facebook Messenger, Viber, or even radio-based and television-based instruction. Your message, Rachel, about not getting to be too attached to the first version of a solution is very valuable. In this regard, the exploration of the potential of WhatsApp can be regarded as a first version. I am sure many of our participants are motivated to try this out, but also to draw from your inputs and try other platforms or means. Once again, thank you very, very much, Ma'am Rachel. What might be other ways of supporting online instruction? What considerations must educators keep in mind? Our next speaker will attempt to address these questions by elaborating on the reality of a classroom at home. Friends, please welcome Mr. Angelo Unai. Yeah, thank you so much, Mamel, for your introduction. Again, I uh, think we're very grateful for uh, showcasing our uh, strategy to remediate the concerns that we have in this distance learning. So for this presentation, uh, we will try to give you a walkthrough on how we empower our uh, pupils and even our parents to continue learning despite the challenges in a distance learning. Okay, we will try to focus on these three concerns. Okay, the first one here is uh, more than the, the, the question about accessibility of education, how do we ensure that learning stays relevant uh, in terms of the mode of delivery and at the same time, the content and competency we deliver? Second one, with the challenge of interaction and communication in a remote uh, setup, how can we promote pupils' engagement in their learning? And then finally, we also need to consider our parents who all of the time are the ones beside our students. How do we guide them to support their uh, children at home? So these are the three main concerns that we will uh, dig deeper into. So to address this uh, concern, we initiated a strategy we named as Project Three O's which is until now being applied in our uh, learning continuity plan for this school year. So this 3O stands for uh, open communication, online instruction, and online kumustahan. So uh, kumustahan in, in English is a simple check-in or a uh, more of a get-together. Uh, we believe that each O played an important role in our implementation of distance learning. And we believe that our approach to this kind of a setup will not be successful if we neglect to do a certain component. 
So let's start with the open communication. So in general, open communication uh, happens when the members in a team are empowered to share their thoughts uh, and, and air their concerns without any fear of uh, repercussions. So the most common way to communicate are through text messages, phone calls, and the use of social media. Okay. As you will see, okay, we have maximized those uh, three platforms. Okay. But since we believe that communication is a two-way process and we really want to know the actual status of learning okay, of our pupils, we also uh, employed uh, different methods. So the first one in line here is the face-to-face -face forum. Uh, we follow the, the minimum health protocol okay, when we implement this. So the reason we conduct this is that we want to know the voice of our parents uh, to make our approach responsive to their needs and so that we can easily make necessary adjustments based on their feedbacks. We also uh, ask our parents to send us the pictures of, or videos of the actual activities of their children at home or even their outputs so that we can provide them some feedbacks on how they can still improve uh, their outputs before submission. And then the last resort okay, that we have here is the home visitation. I know for sure that uh, teachers from the Philippines are very familiar with this. So after three to four weeks of non-participation in any activity, we personally go to their houses to bring their uh, learning activity or learning materials and provide the parents with instructions on how they can better guide their children at home. The second over here is the online instruction. So the context of our pupils last school year was that not all of them can attend online classes due to the lack of gadgets and stable internet connectivity. Uh, we try to maximize whatever gadgets available with them and through the help of our local government, some of them were given free internet access, especially those who were struggling. But more than being able to transmit information and eventually learning, we wanted our pupils to feel the experience of a classroom. The only difference is that interaction and uh, that, the, that the interaction between the, the pupils and the teachers are happening virtually. So to complement this classroom experience, Teachers sometimes request the pupils to wear their school uniform or even their physical education uniform whenever they will do physical exercises or uh, Zumba dance. We also introduce to our parents the concept of a learning space at home. It is a study environment that is free from distractions and has easy access to study tools. Uh, the design of this learning space can be as grand as the one from the first picture or as as simple as the one on the second picture. So during online instruction, teachers use video clip and other applications to engage more their pupils. We try to create a learning experience that the pupils will be looking forward to attend every next every week. Uh, in our context, uh, online instruction is not just putting the teachers inside the monitors of our pupils. Uh, there are three factors are, that are important here. The first one here is the integration of technology. Okay, the second thing is the interaction with teachers and pupils. And uh, the third one will be the atmosphere of a classroom. And the last O here is the online kumustahan. So online kumustahan is a weekly activity of the homeroom advisor with this class through a video meeting. This can be done with uh, the pupils only or together with their parents, depending on the concern of the teacher. Uh, during this meeting, the teacher asks his pupils about their concerns and challenges and even celebrate their small wins. Our main cons consideration here is to address early whatever worry they have or any challenge they have okay, in their learning. So in addition, we also provide them with psychological psychosocial activities to promote good health and good health among our pupils. So as you will notice, uh, this figure here summarizes the different stages uh, we underwent in this project. We started with the identification and setting up of available platforms in reaching our pupils. Okay. 
Then after this, we also conducted preliminary activities such as orientation regarding the schedules, guidelines, and the responsible persons to account for. And then finally, the conduct of our three O's every week. As you will notice, there is a focus area for each O that we need to deliver and monitor closely to guarantee that we are implementing the activities appropriately. So how do we monitor these three O's? Okay. So this uh, question is regarding sustainability of any project. Okay. So we, we need to address this concern okay, because we believe that the program or project should be integrated in the school system to make it last. To make this happen, we reflected each O in our class program. And we even conducted orientation to explain and communicate the possible activities they can and need to do in each O. We also made phone calls. I also made phone calls with our parents and pupils to solicit perspectives about our learning delivery. With the feedback that uh, we and I received and solutions that uh, my teachers provided me, we have improved the system for this school year. So what are the, the key takeaways that we have here in our experience? Uh, one thing that this pandemic uh, has hampered is the connection between the school and the community. The school has to use all the means and exert all its effort to reach its pupils and parents. The second one here is the sense of a classroom. It is quite challenging for the school and most especially for our pupils to separate home from school, play from study uh, during this distance learning. And since all the time our pupils are at home, teachers and parents must provide an environment and stimuli that will let them have a sense of a school during their learning. And then finally, okay, success depends on the partnership between the school and the community. So this goes with the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. Parents and teachers should work hand in hand together with the whole community in supporting the needs of our students. So for those who are planning to uh, implement a similar project, okay, here are some of my uh, suggestions. Number one, okay, the availability of each other to have a fruitful conversation for the sake of our pupils is limited. So for this reason, uh, we need to take the most out of the time we have with our parents and students. The second one here is be always accommodating and always available. We have to extend our effort to support our pupils. Do not hesitate to work 24 seven addressing their needs and concerns. And then finally, I guess everyone will agree with me, always act using your heart. This is connected to the second one. We believe that uh, when we put our heart in anything we do, we will never go wrong and we will emerge as victor in any circumstances that we face. So with that, Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for allowing us to share our uh, learning experiences okay, during this pandemic. When the classroom was in school, in the school campus, educators had great control over what happened inside the teaching learning space, even in the immediate surroundings. Such control helped teachers to manage the conditions so that students could be focused and engaged in the lessons. Thank you very, very much, Sir Angelo, for reminding us about important considerations in the present situation. You have highlighted the need for close collaboration between the school and the home, between the teachers and the parents or guardians of the students. I think your suggestion to consciously provide the students a sense of classroom, even while they are not in school, is valuable. The four-walled classroom may not be possible now, but I agree with you. Time and space dividers, as well as other routines, are important even in a remote teaching learning environment. The consequences of the pandemic on education 
have been daunting and serious. Educators across the globe agree that the perceived learning loss is real and that the loss is greater among students who belong to under-resourced environments. While the precise learning loss is not yet clearly quantified, the OECD noted that K-12 students affected by school closures might expect some 3% lower income over their entire lifetimes. Our panelists this afternoon have offered valuable insights for us to consider so that the forecast about the future of the students in our classes at present does not become their destiny. Thank you, Sir Ramon, for emphasizing the need to leverage the talents and skills of our teachers to design asynchronous learning materials that align with students' needs and interests and that serve to advance learning rather than simply repeat what has been covered during online sessions. Thank you, Ma'am Rachel, for enlightening us about the possibility of some kind of personalized instruction for students who have lagged behind, are lagging behind, in order to meet them where they are and bring them to the expected grade level learning. Thank you, Sir Angelo, for reminding us that our students need us more than ever now, and their needs cannot be met solely through strategies that are a product of our talents and skills, but through interventions that are powered by our hearts, powered by our deep concern for the children and their future. Thank you very, very much from all of us, Sir Ramon, Ma'am Rachel, and Sir Angelo. We learned a lot from your presentations and your insights. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give our panelists a warm, a warm round of virtual applause. Now we're ready to see how the poll went. What is your prediction? Let's see. So this was the question we raised. What challenges do you encounter with tasks for students that supplement online teaching? The challenge um, indicated by most of our participants today, 42%, is the second one. Very few students are self-disciplined to complete the, the tasks assigned to them outside online classes. Then the third one comes next with 24% of our participants uh, providing this response. Many parents or guardians do the tasks for the students. Then coming close is the uh, fourth answer. Students expect their teachers to be accessible and available 24-7. Uh, and only some of us, 11%, think that tasks outside online uh, classes make students feel disconnected no? or um, feel that uh, they are not, feel that they are, uh, that they do not belong, no? that they feel isolated. Okay, so there, that's the uh, result of our poll. Thank you very, thank you very much everyone for sending in your responses to this question. Okay? Now let's take a look at some questions raised by our participants. I'd like to address the first question to Sir Ramon. Uh, this is a question raised by one of our participants, Sir Ramon. He says, or she says, I am thinking about how the elderly mathematics teachers cope with the interactive mathematics teaching using PowerPoint software. So can you give us your opinion about that, Sir Ramon? 
Thank you, Dr. Orason. Actually, that's a very valid point. And I know this from experience. Uh, my mother is also a, a high school teacher. She still teaches to this day. And uh, she is often challenged by, uh, by these technologies uh, with her PowerPoint presentations. Probably she's also in the call right now. And, and she knows this. And I've had teammates also who are quite challenged by technologies. It's a good thing that most... Uh, most subject areas are composed of teams, and it's a, it's a better thing that this is this should not be done uh, alone. It should not be done in a vacuum. When when a team, for example, in a mathematics uh, subject area, let's say grade seven, uh, plans to attempt something like this, it's a good thing that uh, there probably is a mix, a good mix of teachers there. Some seasoned, some new teachers, some are more versed to developing content rather than the actual materials. So I guess my suggestion would be that um, do not go about such uh, such an endeavor on your own. Ask for help. There, th there's bound to be a teacher, a teacher uh, in the same school, uh, who is more versed at technologies. Uh, and uh, just like what we did last year and this year, uh, we have teachers in our grade seven team who were not so techy, if you will. So the division of labor was that. Those teachers who are far more seasoned but are less adept at technologies, they were the ones who crafted the content. They were the ones who drafted the scripts for our videos. And for the ones who are more versed, more adept at uh, dabbling with PowerPoint or Pear Deck or quizzes or any other platform, they were the ones who developed the material. And, uh, and what we've noticed is that it wasn't always actually the case. Since our teachers were more seasoned, uh, who had difficulty in using these technologies at the start of the school year. In fact, because of their proactivity, by the end of the school year, they were the ones who all were already uh, uh, pitching ideas that could uh, and, and, and innovating in different platforms. And, um, and one more thing also, there's really nothing that you cannot learn on YouTube anymore. So there should really be no boundaries to what uh, teachers, even uh, more seasoned teachers, can learn. Uh, my tip is for you to explore triggers on PowerPoint. The idea is that uh, a trigger uh, will attach an action only to when you click a certain object. So that allows you the flexibility to create things like buttons or disappearing objects or effects even that will not be dependent on you clicking on any part of the screen, but rather they will be activated at the click of a button. So do explore that. Uh, I, I, I myself learned from teachers who were more seasoned, less adept at it, but they dabbled with uh, 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 triggers and PowerPoint and I learned from them. And uh, I supplemented that with YouTube videos and that's a very, very easy thing to learn. So do explore that teachers. Okay, I have a follow-up question for you, Sir Ramon. Um, one of our participants says he loved the, the uh, asynchronous learning materials and how they were used for developing the students' higher order thinking skills beyond reading and watching. So here's the question. Would you have notes or guide questions that the teachers used? to determine what they could and trust our students to learn by themselves? Or was the focus more on exploring the concept we can actually entrust more to the students than originally perceived? Um, for one, I think, uh, thank you for, for that question, by the way. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I think for one, the content that we deliver anyway, whether it's, face-to-face -face classes or online classes. The content that we deliver will be from our curriculum, whether it's a national curriculum or a school curriculum, which means that either way, that concept can be learned by the student. Uh, I think it's a misconception that uh, there are kinds of lessons, uh, specifically those that are more uh, cognitive-based or, or knowledge-based rather than those that are skill-based or... Uh, uh, you know, those psychomotor skills, perhaps, that involve the, the manipulation of, of equipment, other, other, other than those types of skills. I don't think that there is a content that is too difficult to learn by, uh, or, 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 or by the student, by himself. I think it's only a matter of how we craft our materials, how scaffolded those materials could be without us um, 
spoon feeding them too much. I demonstrated a while ago that there were uh, materials that I showed you. In, in fact, there are some topics like um, the discovery of uh, properties of a parallelogram, perhaps. Um, one can actually do that by drawing, but there, there will be limitations to human error in that the proper conjectures may not be arrived at. So the, the point really here is it's not really a matter of what they can learn by how we perceive the difficulty of such content could be. Rather, it's more on how we craft our materials that allows them to discover it for themselves. Um, it's in that, uh, I think, idea, in the interactivity of our materials, in our providing them with links to other sources where they can also uh, find uh, concepts that can help them in answering tasks, like the one I demonstrated a while ago about COVID, uh, COVID vaccines rather, uh, we provided on the same uh, Google slide, we provided them with two links, one for the Department of Health and one for the CDC. Now that might seem, uh, at the onset, it might seem like a very daunting task for a grade seven student, for an 11 year old, to discern between uh, three different vaccines, which one can be kept for this long, which is, uh, which is uh, supposed to be administered to this particular age. But again, it's a matter of what materials we also supplement them with, how we craft the questions in our materials, how we tailor the progression of the topics in our presentations. That would really dictate how well our students will learn the topics by themselves. I, again, I don't think there is a topic that or too difficult to learn by themselves. Thank you, Dr. Arasa, for that question. Thank you. No topic that is too difficult for students to learn on their own. Thank you for that insight. Now, may I direct a question to you, Rachel? Uh, actually, this is a set of questions. No? So you may wish to um, uh, consolidate your answers for these questions. One, is the reading initiative for in-school or out-of-school children? And then did you use any other channels beyond WhatsApp? Then what's the age group? Then for the assessment of learning, do you also use early grade reading assessment or early grade math assessment for children in the primary school? So maybe this is really a question or uh, that intends to find out more no, about the program that you implemented, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Orashon. So um, I'll try to keep my answer concise. So um, our program is actually a remedial reading intervention. Um, so it's both for children in and out of school, as long as they're in need of a remedial reading. So like that, what does that mean? That means like if you are seven years old, you should be able to read materials uh, for a seven-year-old child. But if a child is 10 years old and can only read something for up to a six-year-old, then that child is suitable for the program. So those are the children we designed the solution for. Um, we take in students uh, eight years old and above because we think that seven-year-olds will be able to still catch up because they're in their first year um, of school, actually, uh, here, here in Malaysia especially. Um, so as for our WhatsApp solution, um, so we designed this online solution uh, to be a low-tech one. Um, so the structure would still work on platforms like Facebook Messenger, Telegram. Uh, it also will work for Google Meet. Um, so with Google Meet, you can do video things. Like you don't have to rely on video resources, um, on pre-recorded videos, on, on text or on images. You don't have to rely on those you could actually read directly with the child. But because we are thinking about children's safety, we didn't want a WhatsApp video calls. So all of our resources were created to be as low tech as possible. So it was very intentionally done. Um, I, about the reading assessment, mm -hmm. we actually created our own reading assessment. So that's what we use. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. How about this other question? Um, <clears throat> this participant has found uh, my readers no, very inspiring and creative use of WhatsApp, this particular project. And the question is this, was WhatsApp the main mode of instruction or the parents? So I guess the question is asking whether 
the children no um uh, were directly involved or were the parents the medium no for instruction via whatsapp and then um how were the instructions provided no how did this um connect to the modules Rachel? okay so if i can clarify whatsapp was the mode of delivery so the content was still the toolkit the my readers uh, literacy toolkit and um, whatsapp was just a mode of delivery so the parents um not all actually in malaysia the issue is that the parents uh, the children who come who are reading behind levels is really because their parents then cannot read in English uh, fluently. Mm -hmm. So Malaysia, like um, all of our, I'm not sure, I think Philippines is quite different. So for like, let's say Malaysia and Singapore, we speak a lot of languages. So not everyone is proficient in English or can read fluently in English. They may be able to speak in English, but they're not able to read in English. So um, parents, not being able to teach themselves they are not expected to deliver the mode of in, deliver the instruction but they're just facilitators um, to ensure the child uh, sits and learns for that duration um, yeah i think that i think i answered the question or oh, i think there was a question on the module uh, i will drop yeah. a link in the chat to explore that on our website okay thank you thank you very much rachel and now let me turn to you, Sir Angelo. Uh, this is a question for you. In what ways do you monitor that all the activities done asynchronously were completed by your students? Can you share with us your experience, Sir Angelo? So in our school, uh, as, a, as their school, I created, I created a monitoring tool for them. So we clearly monitored first the distribution we make sure that all of our pupils uh, really receive their, their learning modules and other learning materials. And then also we, we, we also created a monitoring tool for uh, retrieval. Okay, so in our context, we, we have our retrieval every, every two weeks, okay, depending on the arrangement of the parents with uh, our, our teachers, okay. But we, but uh, if we notice, okay, for for example, in, in our monitoring tool, we notice that uh, our uh, our our parents or our pupils are not submitting their outputs. We will try to uh, go to another uh, procedure, which is to uh, home visit them. So during home visitation, okay, we also provide them with learning materials uh, in which we validate whether it's really their output, it's really their performance, okay? Or it's really their answer. Are, are they really the ones who answer the, the, the learning materials or not? Okay, that's one way we can validate whether they are really the ones who do the modules or not. Okay, and also, uh, just like I, what we shared a while ago, what we shared a while ago, uh, we also try to ask them, our parents to, uh, sent us with the pictures, actual pictures, uh, actual video of uh, their children doing the, the learning modules. Because one thing that we cannot uh, be sure, okay, and, and that is also the, the, the concern of, not, I think not, not, not just only in our school, but uh, the concern of other school, okay, is to whether, uh, whether is, is it really the, the pupils are the ones doing the outputs or not? Okay, so again, we, we, we need to emphasize uh, during, during the parents' orientation, okay, the, the, the value of being honest, okay, in terms of their outputs. Okay, so it will go down to, to the parents on how we uh, persuade them, okay, to, uh, to be honest, okay, with, with, with the submission of... Uh, the the the, the uh, answered learning materials of their children, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Angela. And I have a follow up question for you as well. What kind of support did you receive, or do you receive from your school, or are all these great initiatives self initiated and self directed 
and therefore it is upon us no teachers to get creative so maybe the question is partly asking you what support you received from the school but also maybe what motivated you no to take it upon yourself to um, um, go into these initiatives angelo yeah so thank you so much again for the question uh, during the onset of the pandemic i think that was uh, i think march uh, by june of 2020 our uh, schools division are already thinking of possible ways in which we can deliver learning okay to our pupils so we received several capacity building and orientations uh, from our schools division regarding uh, how we can conduct uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and other uh, different uh, learning delivery modalities. So when we go back to our own school, we try to contextualize those learning that we have uh, from our uh, division so that uh, we will be more responsive in terms of the, the needs, okay, in terms of the the, the context of our uh, learning community. Because I think, okay, and I, I guess all of you will agree with me that all of us here are working in different learning environment. So we, we, we need to be more creative in a way that, or in a sense that uh, we should be able to address personal concerns, okay, uh, based on their uh, contextualized environment, I think, yeah. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in terms of our uh, the conduct of our home visitation, okay, we do not go straight to the community. So we need to ask uh, permission from the, the local government. Okay, we also ask uh, some of them to accompany us going to this uh, learning community, uh, just to uh, be safe. Okay, every time we we go down to. To their houses yeah all right thank you thank you very much angelo no? there's a question here uh that goes this way and i'd like to tweak this a bit and direct it to all our panelists the original question goes this way what would be another remedy if a student was already uh, already quit school no uh, quit doing modular distance learning. So that's the context of this particular question. Uh, we did home visitation already five times, but it doesn't work. Encouragement doesn't work. But I'd like to tweak this question a bit and address it to all our panelists um, and see you know, what, what, what insights you have in relation to this concern. Um, maybe you have encountered students who have given up. Maybe it's because of the isolation they felt. Maybe it's because of failure. Maybe it's because they have lagged so far behind. No? Whatever reason. Um, can you give us your own sense, your own suggestions on how to address a student no? who has expressed intention to give up on schooling? Can we start with you, Angelo? Yeah, uh, personally, we experienced that in our school. There, I think during the last school year, there, there were, I think, uh, 10 or more pupils okay, who, uh, whom their parents uh, has expressed uh, dropping out their, their children from school. So the first thing that we need to do here is to convince the parents. Okay, we need to go down to the level of the parents, uh, try to talk with them, convince them the importance of education. Yeah. And then in terms of the pupils, uh, one of the, I wasn't able to share this during the presentation. Uh, one of the practices that we did here in uh, last school year was we communicate or we form a community learning center Okay, we, we form a community learning, learning center. Okay, sometimes uh, we, we conducted, uh, I, I don't know if, sorry, if we, if we were allowed during the time okay, because of the restrictions in the quarantine status. But we, we tried to do anything that we could okay, just to 
reach our pupils. So we, we conducted uh, a class in a covered court. Yeah, so that is near to their, their, their community. So I, th those could be one of the ways uh, in which we can uh, reach our pupils yeah, in, in, uh, to continue learning despite of the challenges they have. And also, uh, just like what we shared a while ago, uh, communication is very important. I, I would like to emphasize this. Okay, in this time of pan uh, pandemic, uh, this is something that uh, is uh, hampered okay, among all of us, the communication. So we try to make sure that there will be ways in which we can communicate to our uh, parents and also uh, directly to our pupils. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. How about Rachel? Thank you for that question, Dr. Roshan. So I used to be a teacher in school, in a secondary school uh, for three years. I think uh, I saw that in school as well. So I would say that um, the solution really depends on the root of the problem. So what we see is the student dropping out. Um, but that is just the symptom. What is the root cause? Why is the student not interested anymore? Is it because of fear? Is it because of embarrassment? Is it because now there's a need to support the family with work? What exactly is the problem? Um, so we try to understand that and then come up with the solution that um, supports or addresses that. And I think like um, there were many different solutions uh, deployed based on the need um, at hand. Um, but I do agree with uh, Sir and Hello that it's it's mostly tied to parents at times because for a child to feel motivated all the time to learn, that's not really possible. And that role model that that influence from the parents is important. And, and in literacy, especially, we see this intergenerational cycle. If a parent is illiterate, the child also then uh, is at risk of being illiterate themselves because parents cannot support learning at home. Um, so it's, we've been working more on educating parents and giving them that awareness that you may, you may not be able to teach your child, but here's a, here are some things you can do as a parent to show support. You can uh, create a space at home that is conducive for learning. You can ask about homework, even if you cannot teach. So we are equipping parents with that. I think middle income uh, or uh, well-to-do parents, they know all this, they know how to encourage learning, they know how to get children excited about going to school, but, but for parents from lower income households, they may have other concerns that they cannot focus on learning. So I think like, um, that is a big um, part to work on parental involvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And how about you, Sir Ramon? Thank you, Dr. Rashon. Uh, in fact, uh, just like the first two panelists, uh, they made very valid points. Uh, to add to that, um, there, the, I, I think now more than ever, the role of the teacher, and in most cases, the homeroom teacher or the class advisor becomes primal in addressing such concerns. Um, one thing is that we can, what we can do is monitor them regularly, check up on them. It's not always that when we converse with students that it has to be academic. Now, from time to time, we can ask them how they're doing. We can ask them what interests, what interests them, what, uh, what, what shows they watch, what sports they play, stuff like that. Um, we can also consider embedding wellness activities in their daily routines, their weekly routines. For example, in the Ateneo, every Wednesday is what we call Wellness Wednesdays, where we deviate from academics and give them uh, activities that are more uh, for their character formation rather than their academic training. That also takes the, the sort of uh, monotony away from, from uh, the week. And our students, from the studies uh, conducted by, by the school, uh, mentioned results that students re uh, respond positively to such endeavors. It's also a good thing to collaborate with teachers, let's say, of the same class uh, in that it's good that you're able to monitor how much workload you're actually giving students. And when you speak with the other teachers of the same class, you get to regulate the amount of workload that you assign to them day in and day out. If you're able to see the entire week, then perhaps a teacher can say, okay, for, for, for this day, I'm not going to give homework. Or at least if I do give homework, it's going to be this short only. 
so that uh, the students will not feel overburdened by the tasks we assign to them. But if it does get to the point where a student is already uh, resigned to, uh, to studying, perhaps he's told his parents or even his teachers, I don't want to study anymore. I guess it's important to allow students to take a step back. Um, yes, they are students in the context of your relationship with them as teachers, but uh, their grades is really not the end all and be all of what they really are as, as individuals. Let's allow them to step back. Let's allow them a breathing room. Uh, it's really difficult to know exact contexts uh, in these times. It's... Uh, We've heard time and again that when the pandemic struck, we've heard time and again that uh, that uh, saying that we are all in the same boat. In fact, we're not. We're not experiencing the pandemic the same way. Uh, there are families who have better homes uh, compared to families who don't. There are families who have uh, Netflix connections at home, air-conditioned rooms. They have that. So it's far more comfortable in living in such situations rather than uh, you know compared to other families. So we cannot... Uh, have one solution for for all types of problems, but the understanding should always be present. Now, one of the things I learned from my supervisor, and I'm citing her also, she said that if you had to choose, if it comes down to choosing between being kind and being fair, choose to be kind, especially in these times. And uh, But that comes, of course, with a caveat. We don't just be kind and give them all the, the, the leeway that we can. No, we still have to demand a certain degree of responsibility, accountability, and we still have to train them uh, with, with resilience. Because even after this, beyond this, these are life skills that our uh, students will definitely benefit from. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your responses, all the valuable insights that you shared with our uh, participants in this webinar series. Before the pandemic came, teachers prepared for classes delivered face-to-face -face in the classroom. And then at the time, we already thought that that was very challenging. Huh? I mean, writing the lesson plans, preparing the instructional activities, preparing the assessment, these were all challenging. But then the pandemic came. And now we know that remote teaching and learning requires preparation for both the synchronous sessions and the asynchronous tasks intended to supplement online teaching. When the children were with us in the classroom, we could see them. We knew whether they were sad or happy. We knew whether they felt well or sick, no? and we could ask them how they were. We had a sense about um, how they were doing as far as a specific worksheet is concerned because we could see them but unfortunately that's not possible now no so we thank you for sharing with us various ways by which we can still connect with the students even when we are not physically uh, with them uh, for many educators preparing for both the synchronous and the asynchronous sessions were very challenging but Educators everywhere tried very hard to ensure that the children, that the young people continued to learn and that no one got left behind. So I think that is still our mantra. It is also interesting how you shared that uh, through that first question that was addressed to Sir Ramon, that in leaving no child behind, we also made sure that we left no teacher behind. We also help one another go through this great challenge. Huh? Unfortunately, we see that the pandemic continues. No? It's still there. There are surges in various places. And also, unfortunately, the challenges in the teaching learning uh, process in the instructional arena persist as well. And we thank you, we thank you, our dear panelists, for generously sharing with us the solutions that you put in place no? uh, to address all these challenges, the insights about uh, what we are going through and how we might be able to pull through. So thank you very, very much, um, Sir Ramon. 
uh, Ma'am Rachel and Sir Angelo. Thank you very, very much for an enriching afternoon. And on that note, I'd like to turn over the screen to Sir Vignesh. Thank you very much, Dr. Arashad. And thank you very much to Ramon, Rachel, and Angelo for your sharing. As I was listening through the session, I had flashbacks to my time in school, uh, both good and bad. And I was thinking when uh, they were sharing about how you know, it would be good if teachers discussed with each other what homework they gave so that students were not overloaded. <laughs> I wish a lot of my teachers did that. And then I remember hearing about how parents uh, could be involved in helping their kids do their homework. Um, I might have been guilty of some of that. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you learned a fair bit from our speakers today. I think it was a very frank and honest sharing from educators, from practitioners on the ground on what you as educators and as our constituents and our members can learn and can implement in their own systems, in their own schools, so as to ensure that even during these challenging times, our students, the most important element of the education system can continue being ensured of a quality education. Ladies and gentlemen, before I end, I just want to talk a little bit more about the Facebook group that I did mention earlier. So the Facebook group is teaching, leading, and learning. In a few seconds, I think my colleagues are going to drop us, uh, drop a link to that Facebook group in our chat box. Do visit the Facebook group. Now, we set this up just a couple of months ago with the sole intention, because this is our fourth webinar, Making Headway series. And we've realized that throughout the series, a lot of times there's so many good, great questions actually being asked and often just in the interest of time, we're not able to address them all. So we created this platform to spur more dialogue and conversation because the answers are not just going to be found from our panelists or our moderator or my colleagues in the Head Foundation. No, many of the questions that are being asked actually have very innovative solutions from other members of the audience, from our other uh, attendees. So ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to join the group, continue these discussions, continue these conversations. Now we envision making headway. Our main objective in this was to promote learning from one another. And we hope that through this Facebook group, you'll be able to continue a lot of that learning. So ladies and gentlemen, let me also remind you that next week, next Thursday will be our last session in this, our fourth Making Headway series. And I urge you to join and, and attend that session. The link is also in our chat box and on our website. But beyond that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being a part of this session. I hope that you found the sharing helpful. I hope that you had the opportunity to learn from your fellow educators on innovations that you could implement in your schools. So thank you, and I look forward to welcoming you to our next session. Goodbye.